Good evening and welcome to the Commemorative Air Force Warbrood Tube webinar for this evening. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and we're glad that you could join us this evening. This webinar series is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force, and you can support the CIF through membership or donations. And for details on how you can do just that and help further CIF's mission to educate, inspire, and honor, please visit our website at commemorativeairforce.org. Now, as you uh, listen to tonight's presentation, some questions may come to mind. If they do, just type them in the chat box. We'll save some time at the end to uh, answer any questions you may have. Now, tonight, uh, this is the first of a several-part series of webinars that we're going to uh, host over the next, uh, well, three of the end of the year, actually, uh, with Brad Pilgrim, who is one of CAF's unofficial but almost official historians and we're going to kind of go through the uh, history of the uh, commemorative air force confederate air force when it was founded back in 1957 so tonight we're going to start with the very early years and go back to those uh, early days in mercedes texas when uh, lloyd nolan and uh, kind of a group of his friends uh, has formed what is now known as uh, the commemorative air force so brad welcome and uh, how are things down in texas tonight well, things are pretty good down here, Steve. I appreciate you having me on. Well, good. well tell us a little bit about you and how you came to uh, kind of be the, uh, one of our resident historians. Um, well, it's one of those one of those things where I, I grew up out in West Texas, out in the you know ranching, farming, oil well company uh, country, and uh, my family was not aviators at all. But my dad was a marine, and my mother liked airplanes, so they took us to a lot of air shows when we were kids. And in the you know 70s and 80s, the the CAF was there was an air show every weekend. There was a CAF air show within you know 50 miles of our house, and so we started driving down to Harlingen every year to go to the air show and all that. And as a kid, uh, as you know, eight, nine, ten, eleven year old kid, I was just totally enthralled with the airplanes. But as interesting as the planes were, the 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 people that did it, the people that, it, it amazed me that there was people who were flying these old airplanes and operating these things. At the time, they seemed so ancient. They seemed so old to me, but looking back, some of them are only about 10 years older than I am now at the time, and so they really weren't that old. But I just I just got interested in the people, and I got interested in the story, and the CF was the leader at the time and still is today mm -hmm. in this business of preserving airplanes and, and, and warbirds and flying them and you know, the CAF, uh, Fifi in particular, the B-29, started the warbird touring industry that Collins Foundation and the EAA and everybody else followed along later. The CAF started this entire movement. And uh, I think if it hadn't have been for Lloyd Nolan and his foresight and uh, quite honestly, just his desire to fly old airplanes, I, I don't know how the warbird industry would be today if it hadn't started the way it did. But I just got interested in an early life and, and uh, you know, I, I just kind of got interested in how it all happened and nobody else wanted the job. So here I am. So. Well, well, good. We're glad you have uh, preserved so many uh, interesting tidbits and artifacts from the from the history of the organization. And and let's let's go back. We actually the organization was founded in 1957, but the 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 roots of, of the CAF actually go back to, uh, I believe, 1951. And uh, Lloyd Nolan, when he he buys a, a P-40 Warhawk. Of, yeah. of all things but well, let's even go back so further uh, because uh, lloyd was uh, a flight instructor during world war ii and even before that was a crop duster down in mercedes yeah he lloyd like so many other guys at that time were frustrated fighter pilots you know he he wanted to be he was going to school to be a school teacher actually and had to quit college because of you know family family issues and stuff like that and he really ended up having to raise some of his siblings and stuff like that due to family issues so he became a pilot he, he knew that if he could get his commercial license he could go instruct in the military he had kind of bad eyesight so he knew he wouldn't be able to be a, a pilot for the military but he said well next best thing i want to fly i can be an instructor and he often said and it's in writing numerous places that the most painful thing for him during the war was to get these letters from former students of his talking about these hot fighter planes that they were flying all over europe and the pacific and he said it just gave him a, a gnawing to, to fly fighters, and he just never got to. And uh, he came to Texas, you know, stayed in Texas at the end of the war and got into crop dusting because with all the pilots coming home from the war, there were the airline jobs that weren't that many at the time. They got taken up pretty quick. So him and a bunch of other guys came to Texas and became crop dusters. And down in South Texas in the Valley and out in West Texas and places like that. And uh, 
1951, he finally got in a position where he could buy a P40. He wanted a Mustang, but couldn't afford one. So he found his P40 for $1,500 and he bought it and uh, started flying it around down there in the valley. And you see it says Mercedes dusting service on the side of it. That was his company that he started Mercedes. And I think at the time there was like 10 crop dusting outfits down there in that area. And he had the biggest one with 10 airplanes and nine, nine pilots beside himself. So he was pretty successful in the business. He bought this P-40 and a bunch of his friends were flying around with him in it and everything. And he said, well, we, we really need a Mustang. That was supposed to be the best fighter of the war. We need a Mustang. So he sold the P-40 and was going to go buy a Mustang. Well, that was in 1952, right as, the, right as the war started in Korea. And all the Mustangs got pulled back in to, to active duty service in the military. And so he couldn't get a Mustang. So he had sold his P-40, couldn't afford a Mustang. And then uh, 1957 rolled around. They found a Mustang for sale in San Antonio in the Trader Plain newspaper. And by that time, the price had gone up and it was 2,500 bucks, which was astronomical at the time. And five guys got together and decided, well, we're going to have a Mustang. This is, this is our chance. And so these, these five guys got together and pulled their, pulled their resources and, and they bought the Mustang that we still have today that's called Red Nose. It's with uh, you know, uh, Air Base Georgia now. And uh, that was the start of the CAF. And kind of what happened was they, you know, the, the men that started it was Lloyd Nolan, Billy Turnbull, C.W. Butler, Royce Norman, and Billy Dre. All of them were pilots, but they were the only, they were all crop dusters except for Billy Dre and C.W. Butler. They were both cotton farmers down there, successful cotton farmers, but they had all flown before. So these five guys got together and uh, they, we're flying the airplane on weekends and stuff like that and just playing with it. And what happened was one day they, they showed up one morning, you know, after, you know, flying the day before they came in the next morning and somebody had written Confederate Air Force in black paint underneath the stabilizer. And it kind of became a joke. And, you know, uh, we're, we're, you know, the only Air Force in the South were the Confederate Air Force. And they saluted each other and started calling each other Colonel and everything like that. And that's how it started. And then it was, you know, one, one airplane and five guys. And come to find out later, it was Lloyd Nolan's brother is the guy who said he's the one who actually painted the Confederate Air Force under the tail. Lloyd always said they didn't know who did it, but his, his Doyle, his brother, was pretty sure that he was telling the truth. It was him. But uh, that's how the CAF started. And then a guy named John Wells came along, and he had flown Wildcats and Corsairs and Hellcats during the war. He came along and said, oh, this Mustang, that's a pretty neat airplane, but you know, the Bearcats was much better airplane. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about, all these guys who had been Army pilots, and no, we'll just get us one and we'll race them. And so they went out to Arizona and uh, out to Litchfield Park in Arizona. That was a big Navy and Marine Corps uh, reclamation yard. And there was 82 Bearcats sitting out there. And I was telling you earlier, I've got the original bid sheet from the Navy about all these Bearcats, what they, you know, their hours and what was available and all that. 82 airplanes available. The CF bought two of them. One more got purchased a few weeks later. And then the rest of them, the other 79, all got scrapped. So they, these literally are the ones that came out of the Litchfield Park. They're the only ones that survived that mass scrapping. So they bought these two Bearcats. Only one of them made it home. The one that John Wells sponsored broke down in Amarillo and it took them like six weeks to get the thing home from there. They were not in very good shape, but they got them back. They got this one back from Mercedes and did all the work, got it running. And then they decided they would take it out and race them and find out which one was the best. Well, this was in 1958. Well, every week they were racing these airplanes and seeing who was the best. And they had got to talking about how when they were at Litchfield Park, all these airplanes were being demolished. And they said, well, why don't we buy some other airplanes besides just the Bearcat and the Mustang? Let's see what else there is available. And by this time, they had roughly 10 members. So it started with one, you know, one airplane and five guys. Now it's 10 guys and two airplanes. And they started going around to these different reclamation and salvage yards in Arizona and around the country. And they found out that the U.S. government had absolutely no plan whatsoever to save any of these airplanes other than what was already in like the Air Force Museum and stuff like that. And, and, and not only did they have no plan, they were actively in the process of having them scrapped and they were passing rules that said you could not buy them. So even though the Confederate Air Force name was already there, 
that's really what started the mission of the Confederate Air Force was rebelling against the government's policy of destroying the airplanes. That's what it was. It was a joke. It's like, hey, we're going to rebel against the government because they're the ones who decided to destroy the airplanes. Well, it was someone across the Mason Dixon line who did that. Those orders came from up north. And so that's kind of where the where the actual Confederate Air Force started was over the horror of seeing these airplanes demolished. And uh, it's funny, in May of 1960, in the very first newsletter that the CAF ever uh, published, it was kind of the predecessor to the to the dispatch and everything else. They weren't even incorporated at this point. It was just a loose group of guys. And they said that the longstanding question of which airplane was the fastest was finally settled this weekend. And it was a tie. That's what they said about it. They just, and then for the next several newsletters, it's a fight back and forth over which airplane was actually the fastest. And it just depended on who was writing the newsletter, quite honestly. But that's kind of how the CAF started. You know, it just a bunch of crop dusters wanting to go out and fly hot airplanes. And they all happened to be successful businessmen and were able to afford to do it. And uh, yeah, back then the planes didn't cost anything. They bought the Bearcat for $805. Well, Bearcat today is a three and a half million dollar airplane. Well, at the time, that was that Bearcat right there in that picture was one of only two flying Bearcats in the world at the time because nobody had ever thought to, to save any of these things. Reno and the racing later caught on and that caused more Bearcats to be saved and rebuilt. But if it hadn't been for the CAF preserving this very first one, don't know how many Bearcats would be surviving today. Right. And it's interesting to know that that's, you know, we're like 15 years from the end of World War II, and now all these airplanes are just being like, scrapped. Yeah. Yeah, they were scrapping, and, you know, there was 18,000 B-24s built, nearly 19,000 B-24s built. And at this point, there was one in the entire world that was even flyable. And truly, it was marginally flyable at the time. That's Diamond Lil that the CF would have bought, you know, bought seven years later. But... Even at this point, when the CF, they, when, when these guys got together and said, you know, we've got to find a way to, to save these airplanes. We've got to find a way to do this, but we also have to make enough money to be able to fly them. So we need to figure out a way to do this. So they, they started looking at doing air shows and stuff. Well, air shows back then weren't air shows like you have now. They did like pylon races and tail chases and stuff like that. And no radios, none of the airplanes had radios in them or anything like this. And at this point, you have to think, they didn't even have a T6 at this point. They knew a guy who had a T6 that would they would borrow to check new pilots out and everything like that. He was another crop duster. So all these guys were highly qualified, you know, pilots, and they just wanted to go play. And, and so by October of 1960, when they decided they had to be serious about it, they they sat down and they made up basically what was going to be their objectives. You know, the CF has got objectives today, and 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 they had them back then, and they were very serious but there was humor in it because these were still crop dusters and cotton farmers and i have to put on my glasses because i've reached the age where curiosity overrides my vanity but i have to put on my glasses to actually read this but their first objection uh, uh, objective was to preserve and fly in flying condition as many types of first line military aircraft as possible particularly those that played important parts of world war ii and then number two perpetuate the spirit and memory of these great airplanes the job they did in the minds and hearts of the people and then the third one is where they started getting into, you know, a little bit of fun. Preserve the spirit of the Confederacy. And then the fourth was use all our political influence to have the capital in Washington turn to face the South. And then the last one was have lots of fun, good fellowship, flying and supporting some great airplanes. And that was literally what their goals were. They wanted to save the airplanes, but they wanted to have fun while they were doing it. And, you know, it's it started out you know, just doing this for fun. And then people started coming along going, hey, can you come do a show for us? Can you come and demonstrate the airplanes for us and stuff like that? And they're like, sure, how do we, how do, we do this? Well, that, that's kind of how they got into the air show business is nobody else was doing it. And they're just, it was right, one right. step above barnstorming at the time. That's kind of how they got into the air show business. Yeah, yeah and there, and there and was, there I mean, the forward movement, movement, movement that we, that we see today was non-existent in the in 1960 and uh so these guys from south texas were really the only uh only show in town and uh actually their their first show was at uh kingsville the naval air station there in in 1960 and that that kind of as, as you said kind of put the caf on the map and and uh, 
got some real good uh, attention for uh, for what the group was doing, and also some credibility with not only the the Navy at the time, but also with the uh, the FAA. And and one of the things that in those objectives you hear is that they took their flying seriously, but they didn't take themselves seriously. And I think that that's one of the the great uh, attributes of of the CAF. Yeah, it was it was it was a and I don't mean this in a demeaning way, it was a good old boys flying club. These guys were good old boys, not in the careless devil may care way of looking at things. They didn't have an accident. You know, they didn't have any any crashed airplanes for several years in this, flying them the way they were because these guys were military trained pilots for the most part and were very serious about their flying. And you read some of the old articles that were written about them in the 60s, like there was an article in Sports Illustrated in 1962 that really was the first time anyone had heard the name of the CAF um, outside of you know the flying world. And in there, the way it's written, it almost makes some of those guys sound like hicks when they talk. But at the same time, if you're a flyer and you read in the in between the lines, you can tell they're very serious about their flying and the way they, well, you don't want to try this because this here will bang up your airplane. Well, yeah, they told you you'd bang up your airplane, but what they didn't say was, well, you know, you do this, you'll spin into the ground. You know, so they did it in a humorous way, but they were very, very professional about what they did. Now, the airplanes were not always in the best shape, but that was just the way things were done back then. It wasn't that they didn't, you didn't have parts. And they, they found out around 1962, uh, Lloyd Nolan wrote a letter one time that said, the only way we're going to get spare parts is if we buy more airplanes to take apart because you just couldn't find the spare parts and stuff. There's more spare parts available today than there was back then for these airplanes because they were all sitting in scrapyards. They were all being, you know, still warehoused and stuff like that. And you mentioned the Kingsville show, kind of what's interesting about the Kingsville show is the whole way that happened is Kingsville wanted to have their own little, you know, family day kind of thing, family day and air show. And they thought they were gonna get the Blue Angels. And for whatever reason, that didn't work. And the Blue Angels had another commitment. And the guys at Kingsville are like, oh, no, what do we do? And the guy who was the you know, the, the commander at the time, him and another guy got into the car there in Kingsville. And they drove over to Mercedes one day, one Sunday afternoon. And these guys were out there dogfighting in the Bearcat and the Mustang. And they said, hey, would y'all would y'all mind coming and flying at the Kingsville airship? And uh, they're like, yeah, sure. Who are we flying with? Well, it's just going to be y'all in the Navy because the Blue Angels canceled. And they're like, sure. Yeah. What do you want us to do? Well, just come out and do what y'all do. And well, what's the name of y'all's team? And Lloyd told them they were the Magnolia Blossoms. And that's not well known, but that was what they went by was the Magnolia Blossoms airship team. And so and it was a joke, you know, the the you know the flower, the Magnolia. And so they went to Kingsville and that was what really got them a lot of attention. And within the next two years, they did seven different Navy shows just in Texas because of that exposure at Kingsville. And that's really the first public air show that the CAF did. It was with two airplanes, but that was that was kind of where they got their professional air show start with the military. And, and it paid off for years and years. We had a great relationship with the Navy for a long, long time until just business changes, the air show business and the military's support of air show changes. But all of that that relationship that started in 1960 lasted up to about 1991 before things started changing just in the way air shows happened. And so it was, you know, that was probably one of the better investments the Navy ever made was paying the CF to come do their show. But describe what that show was like. I mean, we've been to air shows to, you know, in, in today's world, and we see the Warbird shows, the formations and, and everything else. But uh, what the uh, the uh, CAF was doing in 1960 was radically different than what we see today they were doing they were doing tail chases and pylon turns and stuff they would they would set up pylons and, and not necessarily pylons like i think the corpus christi air show they said they used the base commander's house because they had a red roof and they said that's the one we're going to use and so they would pick up four points and they would do these races and it was it was it was very much uh choreographed in who was going to win and who was going to lose but they bought they all cheated everybody cheated and they would cut pylons and they would turn around and fly backwards on the course and everything like that and it was a very tight show and then they would break off and do individual aerobatics with the you know bearcat would do some then the mustang would do some then they'd come back and they'd have a dog fight again and it'd be you know 20 or 30 minutes of just the caf flying their airplanes and they might fly two or three times during the show it just depended and they did this for like a hundred dollars and a tank of gas 
you know, and, and to them, that was big money back then. And then, you know, someone else paying for them to come fly their airplanes, that was a great thing. One of the other things uh, that you read about in the early history is the rivalry between the uh, Army or Air Air Force or Air Corps pilots and the Navy pilots. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned that too, you know, which one is faster, the Bearcat or the Mustang. And, and that, yeah. that esprit de corps and kind of... Uh, camaraderie uh again is is a thread that that uh, continues through the early days of the of the organization yeah and as you know I'm, I'm retired from the air force and military people a lot firefighters a lot cops and people like that that are in what you'd consider a high stress job i guess they develop a camaraderie because they're around each other all the time they have a certain way of talking they have their own language they, they do things that you don't do in public because it offends other people but you know, military people, medical people have a certain sense of humor that doesn't always translate into the real world. And that's the way these guys were. They just had their own way of doing business. And Howard Pardue actually said in the, in the 1990s, he said, it's not that it's not that warbird pilots are stuck up or aloof. He goes, we just don't want to talk about anything but warbirds. He goes, so we don't want to talk to other people that aren't warbird people because they want to talk about other things like the stock market. He goes, I've got no interest in that. I want to talk about bearcats and corsairs. So that, that's never changed. That's the same way. When I retired from the Air Force nine years ago, it was the same way. As I say, when you're at work, you're talking about women. When you're off work, you're talking about work. You're talking about airplanes and stuff like that. And that's, that's always been true. The uh, original uh, paint schemes that we're looking at uh, in, the, in this uh, photo uh, were not military uh, paint schemes like we see on, on almost exclusively on, on warbirds today. It was uh, kind of a red, white, and blue with the, the Dixie flag. And um, what was the genesis of that? Truly, I don't, I don't know why they actually painted them that color. My suspicion is that was the cheap paint, was white paint. That is really what I think is probably the reason. Some of some showed up mostly white and they painted red and blue stripes on it and went, oh, this is cool. And so they, you know, if you there are some pictures of CF planes sitting in, you know, eight or nine airplanes sitting on the ground at Mercedes in the early 60s that are all ragtag different colors and stuff like that. And just some are right out of the storage yard still with military colors with the stars and bars painted out and stuff like that. And I think when they got to where they had a couple of airplanes and were starting to be known as a group rather than individuals, uh, they they painted them kind of like the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels. You wanted everything to look uniform so people knew who you were. And uh, I think, you know, on some airplanes it looked really good and there was no set way they did it. They were all kind of white with red and blue stripes, but, you know, Lefty Gardner's P-38 White Lightning kept those colors up until it went to Red Bull after it was restored. But every other CF airplane was repainted into, into you know, military colors starting in about 1968 is when they started painting airplanes. And actually the first airplane the CF had that wasn't, uh, that wasn't painted in house colors was a P-38 that was, that was called Scatterbrain Kid, the original Scatterbrain Kid. And the way things worked, and this is what a lot of people don't understand, the way things worked in the CF back then, the CF didn't buy airplanes. You, if you joined the CAF, you could buy into an airplane and shares like the Mustang originally had five owners and uh, the Bearcat had three guys. And so a bunch of guys would get together and buy these airplanes. Occasionally you'd have one guy come in and say, okay, hey, I've got a, I've got a P-38 and I'm going to operate it with the CAF. And it would be registered with the FAA under the CAF's name for tax reasons. But the CAF didn't own that airplane. And in the case of this P-38, uh, the original Scatterbrain kid, a guy named Reva Sermon over in Louisiana owned it. And it was painted in authentic World War II colors. And he brought it to down to Mercedes one year and, and they saw this military painted P-38 and they're like, we need to start doing that. Well, it was a couple of years before they actually did. That airplane, that P-38 is listed as one of the airplanes we've owned, but it technically was never ours. Neither was White Lightning, by the way. P-38 White Lightning, it was kind of ours at a couple of different points, but Lefty and Lloyd and a couple of other people sold that airplane and traded that airplane back and forth to each other for what could only be for tax reasons. There's no other real reason to do it. And that was very common back then. Just happens, you know, uh, White Lightning's a famous airplane because of how great Lefty flew it all those years. But, you know, Lefty and Lloyd were partners in that airplane. It never belonged to the CAF other than for just a couple of months at a time. 
The only P-38 we ever really owned was the one that became Scatterbrain Kid 2, which was actually a wreck that Lefty and a couple of other guys bought and CF wound up with. But anyway, that I digress. That's how the, the P-38 saga goes. But so they they went with this red, white, and blue paint scheme. And some of them, like the Thunderbolt, was painted red, white, and blue. And it's such a big airplane. It looked like a big white blob with just two little blue and red stripes. I mean, it just, it probably looked the worst of all of them. But I would, I would, I know no one's going to do it, but I would dearly love to see the CF paint a couple of airplanes back in the red, white, and blue schemes for a season for like, you know, the anniversary or something like that. I think it would be neat to do something like that. Because back sure. then, no sure. military planes were painted in military colors. Nobody did it. They were all painted in civilian colors. Yeah, it, it was uh, interesting. Again, contrasting the Warbird movement in the '60s uh, to mm -hmm. what we see today at air shows. It's just uh, when you go back and look at uh, old air show pictures. I mean, obviously Bob Hoover's uh, old Yeller uh, P-51 is is comes to mind as one that was not in a uh, you know military paint scheme. But most other uh, civilian owners painted whatever they wanted. Uh, on the airplane with really no regard to, uh, to preserving history. So uh, again, it was a lot of it was about the value of the airplanes. They just weren't worth putting a fancy paint scheme on. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure these airplanes were painted with a brush. I have no doubt these airplanes were painted with a brush and a roller. I'm sure they were and not to say all of them were, but they just paints just a protective layer to keep the corrosion away, you know? And so the, the planes just were not worth the money that they are today. People don't, they just don't understand that Mustangs were, you know, $2,000, $3,000. You know, Connie Edwards used to say when Mustangs were $5,000 a piece and gas is 25 cents a gallon, a pickup truck guy could afford to own one. And he goes, then they got to be $2 million a piece and gas is $5 a gallon. You got investment bankers flying them. He goes, and who wants to fly with those guys? They're no fun. You know, so it's just the value of the airplanes is astronomical. They, they were disposable back then. It was nothing to belly land a bear cat. And push it off in the weeds and go buy another one. It was nothing to do that back then because the planes were available if you wanted to go get them from the scrapyard. They were available and, and it just they just weren't that valuable. They're expensive to run. They still cost, you know, a Bearcat still uses 90 gallons of gas an hour no matter what year it is. That's right. And as we're talking about paint, uh, also some of the early challenges you alluded to before with, with parts was uh, just as the the... They have the two airplanes. They're going to start adding more, but maintenance and upkeep on the feeding and care of these airplanes uh, starts to take a toll in the in the early '60s on the organization. It does, and and they had gotten so busy at this point. Like by 1962, they were doing air shows as far away as as California. By this point, I mean they were in that in, in that kind of demand, and that's when they got up to they had a roster of 16 pilots in 1961. They had 16 guys who could fly these airplanes because they said, that's what we have to do. Because Lloyd Nolan even said, he goes, I've still got to make a living. And he said, I can't go fly air shows every weekend because I still have a crop dusting company to run. And a lot of the, you know, three of those guys that were the original five that formed the SIF, three of those guys worked for Lloyd Nolan. So obviously as the, as the boss, he's not going to let them go gallivanting about the country when they're supposed to be out, you know, spraying rice fields and stuff like that. You know, so and then by this point, they had started adding airplanes. They got their very first B-25 in, in, in 1961. And the interesting thing about that B-25, most people know there was a B-25 in the 60s called Rowdy's Raiders. And it's the airplane that later had real bad corrosion issues and was donated to the Air Force. And today it's on static display at uh, uh, Lackland Air Force Base down in San Antonio. Well, there was actually another B-25 prior to that, uh, belonged to a guy named Skid Henley. And he donated it to the CAF and it had a solid nose on it. It didn't have the bomber nose on it. That was the first bomber the CAF owned. They only had it for about a year and then it disappeared. I mean, disappeared off the civil registry. All, all evidence of it disappeared. There's no record. I mean, literally it was here one day and gone the next. And it was never actually registered to the CAF, but they did report that he had given it to him. So, but 1961, they went and got the Lefty Gardener joined. And uh, he went and got the Corsair out in Arizona in 1961. And Lefty, it's interesting, a lot of people consider Lefty a founder of the CAF. And in reality, Lefty wasn't. Lefty joined in 1961. But Lloyd Nolan said many times, he goes, if there was ever a person who's responsible for the formation and success of the CAF, he goes, it's Lefty Gardner. He's done more than any, any 10 guys put together could have ever done. So Lloyd Nolan very much considered Lefty Gardner 
to be a far, one of the original farmers of the area. But uh, by August of 1961, they had gotten the Wildcat. John Wells went and picked it up out in Florida. And uh, he's the guy that got him to buy the Bearcat I was talking about earlier. Along the way home, the prop dome fell off of it. It has an electric prop. The prop dome came off of it, hit the propeller, tore the prop up. The motor landed in the Everglades somewhere. He had to land in Tallahassee, and it took a, you know several weeks to get a new prop and a new motor on it. Then it finally made it home. Lefty brought the P-40 home from Florida. Uh, Joe Jones and Lloyd Nolan were the ones who bought that airplane. Um, the first P-38, which had a photo nose on it, and it didn't stay very long before they replaced it with White Lightning. The first P-38 came in from that one right there. Uh, it came in from uh, California as well. Uh, Rufus Shackelford was the guy who paid for that, and then later on, Lefty got in on it. And then the first Hellcat came out. Lefty's brother, Henry Gardner, he went and picked the Hellcat up out in California, and he's the one that paid for that, and he brought it home. And so, you know, by this point, by 1960, the end of 1961, they had a Mustang, a Bearcat, a Wildcat, a Hellcat, uh, a Corsair, a P-38, a P-40, a B-25, and three T-6s. They didn't get the P-39 and the P-63 till a couple of years later, and then they got the P-47 in 1963. But that's kind of where they intended to stop. We're going to stop right here. We've got these, these nine fighters, and then... Connie Edwards showed up and said, you ain't had fun till you've flown an A-26 Invader. And then, you know, then, then the A-26 joins and then they start getting into other things. And uh, they became victims of their own success in a way because they had gotten so busy and so big and had such an investment. Like I was saying earlier, by this point, the investment in the airplanes by 1964 was $306,000. You know, considering they started out with a $2,500 Mustang, and then just a few years later, they're up to, you know, 300 and some odd thousand dollars worth of airplanes in the CAF. You know, so they got bigger. More people got involved. A lot of the fun was still there. But once in a while, some of the fun would start to disappear. Then they'd rein it in and pull it back in. And they hired their first full time. All the mechanics that worked there worked for these other crop dusting outfits and just kind of moonlighted over here to CAF. Well, there was a guy named Dean Alexander who worked for Lloyd. He was a mechanic. He, I don't believe he was a pilot. His wife, Buna Alexander, became the first employee of the CAF. And she was actually one of Lloyd's secretaries. But they hired her to do all the books and keep all the correspondence and all for the CAF because they'd gotten so big and so busy. And prior to that, uh, Lloyd's brother Doyle had been doing that. In addition to running the Mercedes Flying Service, he was also running the CAF. So Buna Alexander became the very first full-time employee of the CAF, and that's because she worked for Lloyd Nolan. So that's how she got in. You mentioned uh, Lefty Gardner and kind of in Lloyd's mind being uh, part of the founding of the organization. He's also one of the mm -hmm. first uh, recipients of the uh, Silver Magno uh, Magnolia Blossom Award. He is. He, he was actually the second recipient. Second the very first right. was a guy named Joe Jones who had to belly land the, the P-40 when the engine quit doing aerobatics and he belly landed it in the field, but he saved the airplane. So he got the first one left, he got the second one. And it was mostly about all the airplanes that he had delivered back to the CAF. But if you, if you look at the actual, everything then was about humor. And, you know, the whole uh, uh, Colonel Culpepper and all this other Southern humor that happened that was all Lloyd Nolan. That was all his brainchild. And in the Silver Magnolia Blossom, uh, the certificate that went along with it for Lefty when for flying all these airplanes back, he got it when he brought the P-38 home. And if you read in there, it talks about how Lefty had made it all the way home, 1,800 miles, and still had four levers in the cockpit that he didn't know what they did. And he said that he flew until he hit Mexico, and then he had to turn because he had met, had his magnetic flashlight hanging on the side of the compass so he could see it, but that was misdirecting him and turning him towards Mexico. And it was written as humor. And you know, that everything about it was supposed to be funny. There was it was an award to show that we appreciate what you did and we appreciate your, you know, your contributions, but we're gonna make it funny and we're gonna have some fun at your expense. And and Lloyd Nolan later on in the in the 70s, even in the early 80s, is some of the paperwork I've got. There were people who took exception to that. There was one particular one in, in uh, 1979 when uh, I can't remember who it was offhand, Vernon Thorpe. 
Vernon Thorpe got the Silver Magnolia Blossom for checking out in the Messerschmitt. And the way that it was written was hysterical. I mean, you just have tears running down your face trying to read it. And somebody wrote a letter to the CAF and said, I was there when y'all presented that. And that took all the prestige out of the award. And Lloyd just wrote in blue ink. He always wrote in blue ink on the bottom of that. No prestige was intended and just sent it back to him. And then I've got the, you know, the photocopy of that letter. It was meant to be funny. And they came up with other awards that, you know, the order of the brass jackass, which we, me, you and I were talking about earlier, which is for the person who did the dumbest thing and lived to tell about it is essentially right. what it was. Then there's the Order of the Brass Double Cross, and then the Scar and Fester Award. I mean, there was every there wasn't anything serious about any of it except for the safety aspect of it, and and the seriousness of what they were doing, preserving the airplanes. But it was like if they Lloyd Nolan, it really always appeared to me that if it wasn't enjoyable, he wasn't going to do it. And the fun extended beyond flying the airplanes. It needed to be fun, and if people weren't enjoying it, then there was no point in being. As you, uh, as we're, we're talking about this, uh, you know, early on, um, everyone became a colonel, so everyone was uh, of equal rank. Uh, but uh, along the line, as as you know, the first employees come along and things like that, the uh, the, the desire to have a leader who wasn't really a leader was there as well. And you you mentioned Colonel Culpepper. Uh, maybe we can just touch on uh, the, the development of of that character itself. Colonel Culpepper. And it's always spelled P-E-P-E-R. It's not Pepper, it's P-E-P-P-E-R. Uh, Bill Crump told me that Lloyd Nolan was very specific. It had one P there towards the end. So it's often misspelled. But Culpepper was kind of because nobody really wanted to be in charge. And it was because it was fun, because it was kind of still a serious joke. They created a mythical leader that was going to exude the Southern charm of what was going on. And you have to remember at the time they were they were drinking mint juleps and having the rebel ball and all these kind of stuff. And they were going to turn the capital facing the south and they weren't going to want. Well, as they said, they had to kick him out of the organization because his best bird dog was caught pointing north. So they had to kick him out of the organization. I mean, it was that kind of fun. And so Colonel Culpepper kind of evolved into. The, the figurehead of this, this mythical guy who kind of resembled Stonewall Jackson and, and the Southern gentleman kind of thing. And it was a joke, but it was, it was, it became later on in years, uh, there's a rubber stamp that they had at headquarters at Harlingen, and I'm sure they had it at Midland, where when somebody would write a letter, they would stamp it with Colonel Culpepper, Jethro E. Culpepper's name. And uh, he was, he was like Santa Claus. If you believed in him, he was real. If you didn't believe him and he wasn't, these are the, you know, some of the various, uh, how he came along, you know, his various entities throughout the years. And you can see there on that bottom picture there who, who he was based off of. And one of the funny things is there was a bust of Culpepper, just a, a, a bronze bust that Willie Hull, who was the ranch foreman out at Connie Edwards Ranch Spring, Willie Hull car carved this, this bust of Culpepper and had it cast in bronze and that used to set in the officers club down in Harlingen. I don't know whatever happened to it, but I know that the original hand carved real bust is sitting out at the Edwards ranch out there in big spring. They still have that out there, but Culpepper was just, a, just an extension of the fun. He was the mythical character who was in charge of it all. You had a general staff, you know, the board of directors like we have now who attended the day-to-day -day business. And anytime someone showed up at Harlingen and said, I need to see Culpepper. Well, sorry, he's he's up at the he's up at the DC right now negotiating to have walls added to the Pentagon or taken from the Pentagon. They're going to change it to the Octagon. You know, I mean, that's the kind of things that they would say. Nobody would ever say Culpepper doesn't exist. And kind of the reason that he he didn't fall out of favor, but kind of the reason that it kind of just drifted into not really hearing about Culpepper much was it caused trouble. There there were people who were you know, high dollar donors and people like that who called and wanted to talk to Culpepper about donating money because they didn't know he wasn't real. And then they found out later it was all a big joke. And there was some people who got their feelings hurt over that. And that's not really what caused him to fade away. It was just a changing of the times. That's kind of why Culpepper kind of left the forefront. He's still there. He's still very much the spirit behind the CAF. But uh, uh, the way things change in another 10 years, I doubt, Many people will know who Culpepper is unless they read through an old 
and see a book or something like that. Right. You mentioned the uh, the bylaws and the Constitution and the the uh, the original Constitution and bylaws that they were put together really have stood the test of time and have served the organization well. Mm -hmm. They have. They've, they've been essentially the same since about 1961. That's when it was incorporated, and that's kind of when all the bylaws came. And other than, you know, there's been some things change. You're still ran by general staff. You still have committees that do things. You still have... You know the, the 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 goals of the CF. They alternate between four and five goals, depending on on when it is. But essentially, it it the only thing that has changed about it is is when the times change. You know, originally there was nothing about even having a museum building. There was a thing about having you know there's there were goals of having airplanes, and then later they had to add another goal. Oh well, we need to have a muse a hangar to put these in. Oh, well, if we're going to do that, because people started donating World War II uniforms and all this, oh, we need to establish a museum, which is where the Combat Airmen Hall of Fame came from. That was originally Lloyd Nolan's idea. He said, you know what? We need to build a Hall of Fame for these people who flew these airplanes in actual combat. We're doing it for fun. They did it for real. And so that became one of, you know, to perpetuate in the spirit and the memory of the, the men who flew these airplanes in combat. Well, as the collection was completed, you didn't necessarily need that as a goal anymore to establish this collection. The collection's already established. But for the most part, the goals have stayed the same throughout the years as far as business-wise. The CF hasn't really changed that much since 1961 as far as the way they, you know, what governs it, what's behind the idea. The technique has changed and the manner in which it's done has changed. But you can see in this picture here, uh, you know, guy standing back there at the, at the door with his continental tie on. And you, the gray shirts and the cowboy hats and, and, and everything like that, that was as much a part of the CAF as the airplanes were. That is what their heritage was. It was all a, a joke, but it was a very serious joke. And, uh, you know, they, you, you can look at those guys right there and you can tell, I think that picture was taken in 1962. I can't remember exactly, but you can look at that picture. That's a Mercedes. And you know, those guys had no idea that this would turn into what it has. Never in Lloyd Nolan's wildest dreams. And he said this in 1990 when the CF started moving to Midland from Harlingen. He said, never in my wildest dreams could I have ever imagined we would wind up where we were. It was supposed to be five guys in one airplane. And, you know, we've gotten up to 10 or 12,000 members at different times over the years, 170 airplanes. Who would have ever thought that? And, you know, and you, those guys at that point, they were concerned about flying air shows, having a good time. And then sitting around the bar at night talking about what great pilots they were. And that's that's what they did. And they started a movement. Those guys in that room literally started this business that I've been fortunate after the Air Force to make a living in. And so many of us have been fortunate to be involved in. It started like that. A bunch of guys sitting around the table going, hey, do you think we could do this? Everyone get your money out. Let's see if we can afford it. <laughs> And that, of course, is always or has always been a part of the Warbird movement is uh, uh, making sure you have enough money to put the gas in it and keep them flying. The only thing that the problems are the same as they always were. The only thing that changes is the dollar signs. That's the only thing that changes. That picture right there is from 1964. And the guy right there at the cowboy hat with the chin strap on, that's that's Connie Edwards standing there for people who don't know. You know, Connie is is a. Uh, he was very important to the CF, very, very important to the CF in the early days. And uh, this, uh, he joined in 1963 or 64, and he got out. He, he parted ways in 1969. But in those short years that Connie Edwards was a part of it, he was a very big part of it. And uh, the CF would not be where they're at today without Connie Edwards. There's no doubt about that because he, he got a lot of planes to the CAF that we wouldn't have had otherwise. He got a lot of a lot of connections made that we wouldn't have had otherwise and uh would have been great if everybody could have stayed friends all those years but it's funny of the original five guys in the caf um three of them dropped out within six years because they gotten a lot of them were in business together and that's what happened with with connie and lloyd and lefty they were all in business together and somebody got their feelings hurt and and you know it's like any other business you mix business and pleasure sometimes it doesn't work out but Connie was very important to the CAF, very important guy to the CAF. And to the Warbird and movement Warbird in, general. in general. Oh my goodness, he's, he's, he's un unbelievably important to the Warbird movement. But these pictures are taken inside what was the first officer's club 
their Mercedes. And you can see all the pictures on the wall behind her. Most of that stuff went on to Harlingen and wound up in the officer's club at Harlingen when they moved there later on. And of course, uh, one of the things I've noticed in a lot of those uh, early pictures was the CAF's penchant for uh, wood grain paneling. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Even when I was a kid in the 70s, that was a very popular thing to have. I'd still have that today if I was allowed to. I, I love wood paneling. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about Rebel Field in uh, Mercedes. What was what was that like? Mercedes was it was a it was a twenty nine hundred foot duster strip. That's what it was, and uh, there was you know they they had airplanes flying in and out of there that were not really suited for that environment. It was a short field. There was houses around there. There was wires on each end. Um, but you know the first time they had an air show there, a, a public air show. They had like 15,000 people showed up to see it. Like, you know, 3,000 cars parked out there in the grass. And you see aerial photos of it. It really looks like a dirt road in the middle of a bunch of cars and airplanes. It's a little bitty place. But they built the museum building there in 1966. They built the big steel, the, the fighter hangar, they called it, because that's really all they had besides that B-25. So they built this big steel hangar and kept the airplanes in there. And that was the first museum and display space. And then... Over in what was left the, uh, Lloyd's office, that was the office building and the officers club and all that kind of stuff. And they finally just just outgrew it. They just literally outgrew it. And, and after they started having their shows there at Rebel Field, the city of Harlingen came to them and said, hey, we like what y'all are doing here. We can offer y'all something better. And Mercedes was a little town. Mercedes didn't have the ability to, to keep the CAF there. But, you know, Lloyd stayed there the rest of his life. Whenever, whenever Lloyd passed away, there was an air show in fly over there at Rebel Field and Mercedes to celebrate Lloyd's life and the formation of the CAF. And I would give anything to know where that sign went. That sign, I never saw the sign. I've seen a lot of pictures of it. I never actually saw it, but I would love to have that sign. I did, uh, and this is kind of off topic, but it just, it just struck me. Uh, how long did Lloyd continue to have a duster service? You know, he I think he continued to dust up until the up until the eighties, up until he just retired. And you know, he he was doing a lot of things on top of the dusting, all the dispatch magazine. He was the editor and, and most of the writers for that. He was on the general staff, he was on all these different committees, he was the you know, the executive director, he basically ran the CAF and he had other people running his duster business for him while he was doing that. But he, he stayed, just like Lefty, stayed in that business the entire time he was flying, stayed, stayed into it. And uh, I think by the time Lloyd died in 91, and I think he'd been retired from crop dusting for a few years at that time. But I don't know whatever happened to the Mercedes dusting service, flying service. I don't know if it just ceased to exist or what. I don't, I don't know whatever happened to it. The building's still there, or at least it was. I guess it's still there. That's one of my favorite pictures right there. And that was, that was, I think that picture was taken in 1962. Or, I'm sorry, 64. And uh, I don't know who the guys are. It was just taken one morning while they were heading out to do their dawn patrol at one of their many air shows that they were going to do. And I think that, you know, you can see the cowboy hat on that one guy and his parachute slung over the shoulder walking out there. There's no herd of volunteers around the airplanes or anything getting them ready for them. It's just, you know, five guys walking out to go get in their fighters and, and, and go play, go play fighter pilot for the day. And that picture is not seen very often. That's, that's not a very well-known picture. Um, we've got the original somewhere. I, I can't remember where I saw it, but we do have it somewhere. And I, I just think that's kind of exudes the spirit of the CAF right there. It's about flying at the end of the day. It's about the airplanes. Yes, it's about the people and the people are very important. And then the people is what keeps you coming back as you know, uh, 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 David Oliver up their headquarters, he likes to say, it's about the people. And Ronnie Gardner, he said, I came for the airplanes, but I stayed because of the people. And that's true, but you have to have the airplanes there because if you don't have the airplanes there, the people won't stay. And so that's why, you know, once again, goes back to those guys walking out there, they never could have possibly imagined what was gonna happen over the next 40 or 50 years with this organization. and. We're still doing exactly what those guys are doing in that picture. We're still grabbing their parachutes and walking out to the airplanes. 
Today, we're doing more rides and stuff like that than we are actually air shows, just because that's the way the industry works. And, and you know, the, the mission's the same. The way of accomplishing it is a little different than it used to be. But I think that picture, you could you could replace that with a picture of people today doing the very same thing. And, you know, it would, it would essentially be the same same picture then as it would be today. Yeah. And seeing that picture as I was doing some research, some photos that, that you had and, and that came from the CAF archives when I, I have not seen that picture before. And, and yeah. that, that struck me the same way is that that could be 1964. It could be, you know, today is, is yeah. the mission hasn't changed. And, uh, you know, the little bit of swagger that's there, but they're going out to fly their airplanes and, and remember the, uh, the greatest generation in the World War II aircraft and the men and women who, who built, flew and maintained those those aircraft uh, between 1939 and 1945. And, and uh, again, that's a, it's a, just a timeless photograph. You know, it's like, you know, my friend Nelson Ezel always said, you know, he's Nelson restored airplanes over there in Breckenridge and was a legendary warbird restorer and legendary warbird pilot. And Nelson told me more than once, he said, you know, it's a lot of fun to do this when nobody's shooting at you. He said, we get to go out and fly these airplanes because someone's buying the gas for us or because we just, got a, a friend who's wealthy enough to own one and we get to work on it we get to go do this for fun he said there was a time when people did this for real and people went out and people died and people didn't come home and he said you always have to keep that in the back of your mind because there's nothing wrong with doing it because it's fun he said but you also need to do it because that's how you remember these guys and that's that's uh, that's essentially to me the whole reason behind the warbird movement there's nothing wrong with it being fun Nothing at all wrong with it being fun, but you have to keep in mind that these there was a time people did this for real, and the reason it's commemorated is because people, organizations like the CAF and so many other private owners and all that they spend the time and the money and all of our volunteers put in all their hard effort to commemorate the people who did this for real. And we can never forget that. That is so very true. Uh, Brad, in the, the few minutes we have left, uh, any of the, the folks who are, are watching today, if you have any questions, go ahead and type those in the chat box. But any final thoughts as we sort of wrap up the, the early years of, of CAF? And, and uh, in the next session, we'll, we'll uh, take a look at uh, how the, the fleet was built in the, the mid to uh, late 60s. But just in the early years, maybe some uh, concluding thoughts on your part. The, the thing that I want people to know about the CAF more than anything is, is the history of the name and i always talk about this you know the confederate air force name it it gets lost especially in today's day and age just in the situation the political situation we're in today it was never about the confederacy it was never about the civil war or anything it had nothing to do about any of that it was literally a bunch of guys in who happened to live in south texas literally were rebelling against the government's policy of destroying airplanes and people could never forget that it started as a joke and and it was purely never intended to be as i said earlier more than five guys in one airplane they never thought it would ever morph into what it did and even lloyd nolan said in 1967 we need to change the name this is not going to play outside of our little area and so that's what i want people to take away if, if they take nothing else away is the name has nothing to do with anything with the confederacy or the civil war it was literally a joke that has lasted a lot longer than anyone ever thought it would, quite honestly. <laughs> that is that is very true. Uh, do, we do have a question just popped up. Um, any idea of how they uh, came up with the gray uniforms instead of uh, olive drab or blue or why no, gray? I'll, I'll tell you what I actually think is, is the reason. If you see some of the pictures from Lloyd Nolan's duster service from the guys who work there, they all wore like these work clothes, like rental work uniforms, like Dickie work uniforms or whatever, and they were gray. And I think that's just happened to be what they had, because if you think about it, originally, they didn't wear patches or nothing. That 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 shoulder patch that we have, uh, the first one came out in 64 and the next one came out in 67, but the wings came out pretty early. And all these guys wore on their uniform was a name tag and wings. And I really do believe that the gray was simply because that's what the work uniforms were. A lot of people have said Confederate gray, Union blue. I don't think that really, that may have become part of the joke, but I don't think that actually had anything to do with why they wore those uniforms. And that, that uh, in that context, that makes that makes a whole lot of sense because that would yeah. have just been the extension of, of what they were doing. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. 
These were crop dusters and crop duster mechanics who played with old airplanes. There you go. Uh, we're getting lots of thank yous from uh, folks who are, are watching tonight. Um, and here's a good question. Where can uh, people find some of these old CAF photos? Um, I guess the, the Blue Book is probably a good place to start. The Blue Book, if you get a hold of the old Blue Book, it's, it's a good place to start. Um, most of mine actually came from um, a box of old photos that I acquired. That's where most of mine came from. And a lot of them come from the old original newsletters. I was telling Steve when I first started, I've got all the original newsletters from 1960, starting with number one, the actual copies. And uh, a lot of those pictures came out of there. And I would, I would sell my soul to have those original pictures from there because a lot of those are really, really good pictures that unfortunately don't reproduce well off of newspaper, you know, but they were really neat pictures when they were taken. Right. You just have to look around. You sometimes you find them on eBay, but not very often. Yeah, I was going to say eBay is uh, eBay. Don't is, a, is it. a spot for uh, for a CAF memorabilia. Uh, and uh, well, here's a good question, Brad. What's your uh, your favorite dream World War II aircraft? Oh, Fifi B twenty nine Fifi. That's my that's that's my dream airplane. No matter what. No matter what. All right, and we're we're going to talk about Fifi when we uh, when we delve into the the seventies because uh, Fifi and and uh, uh, the Transpo uh, shows are a big part of of the uh, CAF in the nineteen seventies, and that's uh, coming up in a couple of sessions. We'll uh, we'll have those those for you. But uh, again, Brad, I appreciate you taking time tonight to uh, share your uh, insights and and uh, some of the the stories behind the uh, the very beginnings of the uh, commemorative air force confederate air force caf whatever name you'd like to call us uh, it's fine and and uh it really is it, it is fun to delve into this and and uh, look back at the some of the, the fun and and again the, the fact that they took their flying seriously but they didn't take themselves seriously which uh, i think has been such an appeal to the, for uh, so many people to the organization yeah well i appreciate you having me on i, I hope people find the history as interesting as i do to me that to me, the, the history is as interesting as the airplanes. It really, really is. Um, I'm surprised nobody else tried to find all this crap out before I did. <laughs> you know, quite <laughs> honestly, if they did, I wish they'd give me their information so I don't have to study it so hard. There you go. All right, Brad, again, thank you. And uh, our, our next session is going to uh, be uh, about building the fleet from uh, the uh, early 60s through uh, 1970 and as uh, the, the the completion of the original fighter uh, collection, and then getting into the bombers, the B-17s, the B-24, and uh, the uh, up until uh, Fifi, which comes in the 1970s. So watch for that. Uh, it'll be posted on the uh, events page, and make sure you sign up for our, our next webinar. All right, and with that, we're going to uh, close out tonight's broadcast. Again, thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week at uh, 7 o'clock Central Time, next Wednesday night. Uh, if you have any suggestions for future uh, topics, things you'd like us to discuss, just drop a note to Leah Block at media at cafhq.org. Again, thank you to you, Brad, for, uh, for joining us. We'll look forward to our next session. And uh, thanks again for everyone for uh, joining in tonight for the Commemorative Air, Commemorative Air Force or the Confederate Air Force, whichever, CAF. I'm Steve Buss. Have a great night.